Welcome to the Afikra podcast. My name is Mikey Mhennam. Today we have another special episode focusing on Palestine. This is one of many episodes that we've released in the last couple of weeks. So I encourage you to go out and check, uh, go back and check some of those out. Today we are speaking with Steve Sosby, who is the president and founder of the Palestine Children's Relief Fund. This episode is being recorded on Tuesday, November 7th at 7 p.m. in Palestine. Um, Steve, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. For people who are not aware, what is the easiest way to describe what PCRF does? Uh, well, Palestine Children's Relief Fund actually does a variety of different impactful programs and projects on the ground in Palestine and in the Middle East on a larger scale, including Lebanon and Jordan. Um, we are first and foremost, there's two things that we do that most organizations either don't do or on a much smaller scale, which is we bring injured children out for free medical care they cannot get locally. And we've brought over 2,000 injured kids since our founding over 30 years ago for free treatment, including uh, most of them going to North America, but some to Europe and some to uh, the Gulf, in particular to Dubai. In addition to that, we're the main organization in the world that sponsors volunteer surgery and medical teams to go into Palestine and places like Gaza to do a couple of things. They do needs assessments to identify where we can use our resources in the most effective way. And also they do surgery teams where surgery missions and medical missions where they both train local doctors and nurses. And they also provide direct medical care and surgical treatment for children who otherwise are not going to get that care locally. And we do thousands of operations a year on the ground in local hospitals for free in such specializations as open heart surgery and orthopedics and hand surgery and plastic and reconstructive surgery and maxillofacial, cleft lip and cleft palate, um, neurosurgery and spine surgery and uh, so on and so forth. The list is long, but we're the main organization doing that. Uh, in addition to that, we also have been building up services and infrastructure in hospitals. We built two pediatric cancer departments, one in Bethlehem, one in Gaza. We've built a pediatric intensive care unit in a cath lab in Ramallah. We've opened and rebuilt the emergency departments in Hebron and Janin. We built NICUs in Calcilia and in Janin Hospital. Um, we've also, um, in Lebanon and in Jordan, provided dental clinics and other types of uh, infrastructure support. We also provided a lot of expensive equipment and materials uh, for hospitals where there's shortages. Uh, in addition, in Gaza right now, we're building, um, in addition to the pediatric cancer department that we opened in 2019, uh, we're building a cath lab in the European Gaza Hospital. We were completing the operating, complete operating theaters had just been rebuilt in the N Indonesian hospital and in Al-Aqsa Hospital. And we're building a transplant uh, department in the Shifa Hospital for kidneys, uh, transplant and other uh, transplant services, which are currently not available in Gaza. In addition to that, we do a variety of different types of programs on the ground in the areas of mental health in Gaza for children who are traumatized, for kids who are missing limbs and who are amputees in Gaza. Um, for um, uh, sponsorship programs, we have an orphan sponsorship program. We have a monthly medical sponsorship program. Um, those are all some of the areas that we're working in, in addition to others um, that really are providing direct medical care and humanitarian aid for children on the ground and to really trying to develop and improve the health sector in general to be more independent and self-sufficient and have a better quality of care, save lives and reduce the referrals abroad. Because, you know, the difficulty of children going outside for care is both expensive and it's a great burden on their families. And uh, if you don't have a health system that can provide the kind of specialized care that these children deserve, they have to go abroad. And, uh, you know, in Palestine, logistics is one of the main challenges. If people are under occupation. They can't move around easily. They need permits. Um, and there's checkpoints and there's walls and so on and so forth. So that often impacts the health of children. In some cases, kids die as a result of not having access to care. So if we can develop that care within the local health sector, we're going to be able to save lives and improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the um, of of patient care in Palestine. Steve, wow, that is an. <laughs> but that that's is, just the start. There's going to yeah. be much more that we're going to do. That look, uh, let's get right to it. What's happening in Gaza now? The apocalypse of uh, of Gaza, the complete the breakdown of 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 the health sector, the genocide that's being committed against Gaza children um, is a challenge for each of us individually as human beings. Yeah. It's a challenge for each of us who are committed to the Palestinian people, uh, whether you are doing it for your nationalist uh, uh, responsibilities as a Palestinian or you're doing it as a human being who believes in the basic principles of freedom and justice and equality, like myself. Um, we are now challenged with how we're going to respond to this complete and absolute destruction of the Palestinian presence 
in Gaza, particularly those affecting children. As we all know, the current statistics are over 4,000 children known to be dead, another 1,200 buried under rubble who are presumed to be dead or will be dead. Um, and that's only going to get worse in the coming days, weeks, and months. Uh, and the point here is that this is affecting every aspect of child life in Palestine and Gaza. The education system is shut down. Children are completely traumatized. They're going to be suffering from significant psychological trauma as a result of experiencing and witnessing over an extended period of time this huge abuse and use of state violence, um, the destruction of their homes, the, um, the killing of their families, themselves being injured, um, the insecurity of living under constant bombings and threats of being bombed. Um, that's a long-term generational um, damage that's being done to, to the Gaza children. Um, that's a challenge for us, the education system, the health sector, the mental health needs of the kids there, the opportunities that they're going to need to live better lives in the future, the healing that has to take place in Gaza is something that we as an organization and as individuals who are committed to this cause and to these people um, have to come up with new and creative ways to use our resources to have the impact and the response that's needed to give these people there an opportunity to have better lives, to show them hope, and more importantly, show them solidarity, that we are standing by them, that while the world allows their children to be killed by these expensive and billion dollar weapon systems, um, as if they're just insignificant presences and hindrances and have no, uh, there's no humanity at all. We love our children in Gaza and we're going to do all we can to heal them and to show them the compassion and support that they need to live better lives. Um, Steve, can you talk a little bit about how you're actually, um, able to support these health systems in Gaza during a complete, I mean, it's all, it's been a 17 year old blockade, but now how are you even getting help in? Yeah. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? Because there's been a complete closure since October 7th and that closure has entailed the bringing in of any kind of humanitarian aid, food, water, um, clothing, uh, sanitation supplies, medicine, medical equipment, um, everything that's needed for um, just the functioning of any kind of civil society has been denied access into Gaza. And the amount that's been coming in through Egypt only recently is a very small amount of what's actually needed, far short of what the needs of the people are. And let's remember 1.5 million per people in Gaza as of today, and I'm sure that number is growing every second, 1.5 million out of 2.2 are displaced. They're living not in their homes, and 40% of the homes in Gaza, and I'm sure that number has increased significantly over the past um, uh, day or two, 40% uh, of all dwellings have been destroyed or damaged and made uninhabitable. Winter's coming. People are living in schools. They're living in tents. They're living in warehouses. They're living wherever they can find shelter. Um, there's 400, 500 people sharing one bathroom. There's no clean water. There's no food is scarce. Um, it's just a complete opportunity apocalyptic nightmare and it's happening in front of our eyes. The whole world is witness, witnessing it and nobody's doing anything about it. So what are we able to do is your question. I'm just yeah. framing it for you as to what the current circumstances are. And they're much worse than that if we want to break it down even further in details, but that's the general sense um, is that um, there's a couple of things. First is that we're, we, what we did is we first went through a process of identifying exactly what the hospitals need and how we can provide those uh, needs to the hospitals there. Um, we got a list from all of the physicians that we work with in the different hospitals in Gaza, the main ones, Shifa, Nasser Hospital in Han Yunus, European Gaza Hospital, Al-Aqsa Hospital in Dirabala, the Indonesian Hospital in Beit Lahia, Rantisi Specialist Hospital where we have our pediatric oncology department, the Emirati Neonatal uh, Hospital in Rafa. We know all of these hospitals. We work with all these hospitals. Um, How have, many are there, sir? Just... Well, there's uh, for the in the public sector, there's 21 main hospitals in Gaza, okay. and then with the primary here, primary clinics between NGOs like UNRWA and the government, there's 70 70 something primary clinics. A lot of those are closed now. Some of so... them have been destroyed. Some of them have been bombed. You know, the, we all know what happened to Al, Al, Al Ahli Hospital um, so and the bombing that took there. Of the, the 21, mass... how many do you know that are still operational right now? Yeah, I think something like 50% of them are, are not functioning of those. And But let's let's be more specific. Operational means what? So even Shifa Hospital, which is the main hospital in Gaza, um, has always been the main and largest hospital and now is completely surrounded by um, the Israeli military in the south and in the north and in, in the east, as well as the Mediterranean to the west. That hospital uh, um, is now running on one generator and just the basics and necessities 
of services are being provided there, but the vast majority of services are no longer being able to provide it. And what does that mean? Well, that means that um, the kids, you know, electricity is being provided by generators because the electrical system in Gaza doesn't hasn't operated since October 11th. Um, those generators are running out of fuel. Um, they haven't had new fuel shipments into Gaza since October 6th. And as a result, um, all of the uh, reserves are nearly depleted uh, for that hospital to be able to operate and run its operating theater and provide lights for surgeons to operate on uh, children who are suffering from these terrible injuries and to provide um, power for the incubators in the neonatal unit, which I know we were working in and trying to provide services for. Dozens of babies are going to die when that generator runs out of fuel, which is soon. For all the children who are on ventilators, artificial breathing machines in the intensive care unit because of their injuries, and there's dozens of them, are going to die when these ventilators don't have energy to continue to provide artificial breathing for these children, and so on and so forth. The anesthesia machines won't be able to run to provide anesthesia for patients who need it during surgery. Um, that's the situation that every single hospital in Gaza is facing at this exact moment. So when we say operational, you, there has to be a definition of what operational actually means. Already, these hospitals are running out of basic medication, pain medication. There's pa patients are having surgery now without proper anesthesia or pain medication. Kids with burn burns, third degree burns on their body. Children are getting Tylenol rather than actual pain medication. If you've ever burned your finger, even at the very tip of it, you know that the pain is uh, often unbearable. Uh, imagine you're, you're a child and you have uh, third degree burns over 40, 50% of your body and you don't have pain medication because that pain medication is not has run out. Um, and what that means for that particular child and for that family and for that health provider that is stands in misery, unable to provide care and comfort for their own patient. It's just beyond the scope of imagination or humanitarian terms. It can even be described adequately to give the sense of how bad the people there are suffering and the injustice that they're having to endure this very moment. Um, so the problem when we say operational is that we have to define what operational yeah. means. Can I and ask you, challenge. do these hospitals even have access to water? They have access to water, but it's not clean water any longer. So Gaza has five desalination plants, based small ones. They're not, you know, the kind that you would see in in in, in developed country. But they're they you know they provided some basic water services, and that water has been, excuse me, those desalination plants no longer operate because either they've run out of fuel themselves or they've been damaged by bombings and airstrikes. So the water that's coming in, there's one pipe that the Israelis have closed and opened and closed and opened, which goes to southern Gaza in the Han Yunus area. But in Gaza City itself, which is completely surrounded, as I mentioned, um, there are no clean water sources. So the tap water, 90, even before October 7th, 95% of the water that came into Gaza when people opened their taps and drank from the faucet, that was undrinkable. That's unhealthy water. It's not filtered. It's not clean. And add to this that the sewage treatment plants in Gaza are no longer functioning and operating. So human waste is in the streets. It's affecting the entire population. And... Um, and this is having a tremendously negative impact also on the public health, particularly for children. Um, so it's just a complete breakdown of, of the um, infrastructure and the social needs of the population there. How are, are you and the organization adjusting your typical, your typical uh, approach to work, your raison d'etre? to to address not even address to react to what's happening how has your internal organization changed after this you know seismic change in the the living day, the day-to-day -day living conditions in in Gaza well let's keep in mind that we have 40 staff in Gaza um, who are trying to stay alive um, there are no safe spaces for them um, they have families they are young people, for the most part, who are field workers or humanitarian, uh, who are um, social workers, who work in our cancer departments, who work in the mental health program, who run our amputee program, who are in the field running medical missions, who are accountants, who are procurement specialists, who are program coordinators. Um, all of them are trying just to stay alive. And our office was bombed actually uh, last week, and that's no longer operational. Um, and even if we were able to operate an office in Gaza at this moment, there's no aid to give because that aid is not coming in. And all of the what we did initially is we provided aid through the local markets when the first, when uh, in October 8th, October 9th, October 10th, we exhausted the local markets of uh, humanitarian aid that could be provided through internal sources. All of that's exhausted. So from an operational point of view, for you know, with the organization and how we're managing, 
um, we're not able to uh, implement any programs other than in our cancer department where our head social worker has courageously gone and, and stayed, embedded herself in that department 24-7. Um, we're simply not able to uh, operate on the ground there. And no organization is, by the way. Maybe UNRWA is because they have a large local staff and, um, you know, have some UN protection. Uh, although, you know, honestly, that protection has not provided them uh, the protection that one would suspect because they've lost uh, dozens and dozens of staff who've been killed over the past month. But in addition uh, to that is that, you know, psychologically for our organization, we're just trying to make sure that our staff are alive. Um, during this terrible crisis, and you can only imagine uh, what it means every day to wake up and ask if your staff have been, if anybody in the team has been killed overnight. Um, in addition to that, we have obviously six offices in the West Bank, and there's a huge, huge conflict on the West Bank going on, which is a bit overshadowed because of the carnage and the uh, genocide that's taking place in Gaza. But in the West Bank, we're seeing um, every day five, six, seven, eight, ten people killed. Some of them children. We're seeing huge numbers of injuries. We're seeing the impact economically of towns and villages and communities being isolated by settlements and by the military, cut off through checkpoints or settler violence on the roads. And this is also creating an economic crisis and a humanitarian crisis in the West Bank as well. There, we're able to implement programs because our team are still, teams are still working. Um, they're not under the same threat, uh, existential threat that our team in Gaza is facing. But nonetheless, uh, it's, we've, you know, oh, We've had to refocus our attention away from long-term support and development of the health sector through training, through strategic programs and projects where we were actually doing specific workshops and conferences and training and missions. And now we're focusing on emergency aid and emergency relief. And that's, uh, you know, we're able, we're efficient enough to refocus our energies in that direction, but it's having, uh, obviously it's taken away from the greater purpose, which should be to really develop sustainable, independent services in the health sector. Have you seen a, a, a global rallying cry from the sort of donor community or from the international medical community of people who are saying, we never cared about this before, but this is, we realize this is a, um, a, uh, I don't know how to say this, um, um, crimes against humanity. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a pivot point for a lot of people uh, on their conscience, and you know, we didn't care about this before, but now we can't not care. Yes. Um, have you seen that that sort of change? Uh, we have. We've seen it both in the donor field, which is important, obviously, but even among just general institutional changes that you know, traditionally we do not see the kind of support that we're seeing today. Even the daughter of the vice president, Kamala Harris, who you know. Completely against the position of the U.S. government that's taken on this issue in particular. That's a mild statement from my part. She even came out and, and endorsed supporting our organization, and she's you know uh, somebody who carries a lot of weight. People follow her on social media, and it's reached that level of of uh, the power structure. But I think your questions on a more general sense of about the Palestinian issue in general, and I think if you look at how social media is affecting people, because you know there's been traditionally when I started my work in Palestine over 30 years ago. Um, there was no internet. And the ability to share information at that time was very easily filtered by the few media outlets and, you know, New York Times and a few TV channels and cable news was just starting at that time as well. So the ability to kind of control these images uh, was something that was able to also control the public uh, perception of what occupation meant, what Palestinian um, life was like under occupation in the West Bank and Gaza that was easily filtered and easily managed. That's not possible any today with social media and with some of the courageous work that's being done on the ground, particularly in Gaza, by journalists who are able to share images which are unfiltered. Uh, and in some cases, that lack of filtering has deeply affected all of us from a human and psychological point of view because we're seeing images which are often too graphic to even describe of children with, you know, the kind of injuries and death and the pain and anguish that parents who are carrying dead babies and so on and so forth. Um, you know, that just is something that I think people are seeing now, and uh, it's starting to change significantly the perception that the general population has of what's happening in Gaza from a human point of view. At some point, there's you can only try to justify your position of inflicting violence on a po an, an unprotected or civilian population through these political justifications. At some point, it just runs out of any kind of uh, credibility when the alternative is just a huge number of dead and injured children and civilians and destruction of schools, of churches, of mosques, of hospitals, of UN buildings, and so on. You can't be justified, no matter what effort. And on the contrary, an effort to justify it only garners further uh, opposition and anger. And people hear 
these efforts to kind of justify the killing of children, and it just makes them more um, supportive of uh, the Palestinian position, or at least the Palestinian uh, um, the, a need for protecting civilians in Palestine, in Gaza, and also a call for a ceasefire. Uh, you see it even among the Jewish population in the United States, particularly the young Jews uh, and Jewish Voices for Peace, and if not now or not in my name, excuse me. Um, these organizations are really motivated. They're very well organized and they're very active. They've closed down the Statue of Liberty. They've closed down Congress. They've closed down Union Square in New York City. They've done things which are civil disobedience. It's nonviolent, uh, but it's bringing this attention not only from the side of the Palestinians where it's mainly Arab demonstrators or Palestinian demonstrators or people like myself who are sympathetic to the Palestinians, but also from the other side, the people who are traditionally, you know, have positioned themselves as on the side of Israel are now coming out and saying, this is too much. We're calling for a ceasefire. It has to be done. And this is the young generation. And they're getting a lot of attention and it's making a s significant change in the perception of this issue among the general American public. Um, I saw a report a couple of weeks ago um, talking about um, that the risk of widespread disease so even if there are people who aren't injured because of the sanitation situation, uh, the sanitary, the lack of sanitary uh, um, products, and because of the plumbing situation and uh, lack of water, there's a serious risk of being there being widespread disease. Could you talk a little bit about that? If I'm misunderstanding that, um, or if that is a major concern? Oh, it's a major concern. It's already taking place. I mean, as I mentioned before. People are not drinking clean water, and children are not drinking clean water, and that's having us. You know, people who have, you know, the older population there of, of elderly folks who already, you know, have some uh, are high risk for um, with the suppressed immunity systems, and and already, you know, are vulnerable to um, containing or to being sick and contracting um, viruses and uh, bacteria infections. Those are now widespread. You have when the the water is not clean because their water filter is not being provided, They're, the desalination plants are not functioning, and clean water is not being provided because the occupier has cut off the source of clean water. People are, children and old people and vulnerable people are drinking, and people in general, even healthy adults like ourselves, are drinking um, um, water that is not filtered and clean. Um, there's going to be a public health crisis. You have, as I mentioned before, the breakdown of the water treatment plants and human waste and sewage is now rampant in the uh, streets. And now it's not being properly managed by the infrastructure, which is broken down. That's going to create a public health crisis and already has. Um, when people don't have access to medical care um, because the hospitals are overwhelmed or they've run out of medication or they don't have access because they're their hospital that provides them dialysis treatment or provides them any kind of care is in a place that's on the other side of the uh, checkpoint or it's too dangerous or there's no gas in cars to get to those facilities or even in ambulances. And that's a huge, that's going to cause people uh, further, further um, health concerns and health issues. And it's going to bring a rise in fatalities and in death. Um, but on a widespread scale, there is definitely a huge, already starting to see an outbreak of infections, of diseases of um, these kind of crises, which are just beyond the scope of what can be managed properly by um, what exists of a health system, which is collapsing. If there is a ceasefire that happens right now, let's just say somehow October, uh, November 7th, there's a ceasefire happens right now. Um, what are the challenges, um, the first sort of five actions that need to take place um, from your perspective, from a medical perspective, uh, to support the children. And, and let's just focus on Gaza right now. Well, that's uh, assuming that the ceasefire is uh, adhered to by all parties, which has not always been the case in the past. If there is of an course, actual real yeah. ceasefire, um, the things that need to be provided immediately is the urgent aid. Obviously, there's food insecurity right now. People need food. Um, there's lack of clean water. People need clean water. And then obviously housing. Uh, you know, 1.5 million people are living displaced from their own homes, from their own, which were in some cases were already inadequate to begin with. People have been living in refugee camps for the past, since 1948 in Gaza. There's eight refugee camps and some of them are over 100,000 people. Those need to be, uh, they need to have their homes rebuilt. They need to be able to have safe uh, homes. Winter's coming. Their elements are quite harsh in Gaza during the winter. There's terrible rain. There's terrible winds. There's terrible cold. 
people don't have protection from those elements. That's what's coming in front of them in the next couple of weeks. That needs to be provided. In addition, what about education? You have a whole generation of kids who are not going to school and not going to be able to have access to school. Um, so if there is a ceasefire, I mean, obviously you need to get people the basics to survive. They need food and water and clothing and shelter and medication and medical support. And then they need on the longer term to have an, a shelter and to have clothing and to have um, education and to get back to their lives. They need money to be able to live. Um, these are all the basic necessities which are currently being denied to them and will continue to be denied to them as long as the security situation on the ground is basically there is no security, that there is no safe spaces. Even in the South where they claim um, those are secure areas in Rafa and Han Yunus and Bani Suhaila and in the central area of Brej, Nusrat and Magazi and Dirabala, those are all areas that are constantly being bombed on a regular basis. We've seen large-scale bombings in Magazi camp and in Nusrat camp recently, which killed dozens and dozens of people, mainly women and children, which are supposed to be safe areas. So until there's a ceasefire, there's just a general lack of security. And every day, innocent children and innocent people are going to continue to be killed. You might be closer to the advocacy, um, to folks who are doing advocacy and policy circles um, in the U.S., um, have you noticed, is there any movement happening internally, um, on the, on people calling seats, uh, for a ceasefire? Yeah. I mean, it's, as I mentioned before, you have our, uh, brothers and sisters from the Jewish community with, um, you know, as Jewish voices for peace and, uh, not in my name. And so other coalition groups who are very actively calling for a ceasefire you have on a larger, you know, I think there's a strong movement in general. Uh, among uh, people uh, on the ground who are not traditionally part of this Palestinian rights and Palestinian freedom issue, who are now openly advocating for a ceasefire, um, either their groups or individuals, uh, I think that's significantly changing. Now, whether that has a change on policy, with, that remains to be seen. We've seen even our traditional allies in Capitol Hill, like Bernie Sanders, for example, refusing to call for a ceasefire. And that's quite disconcerting because actually, you know, the vast majority of people recognize that without a ceasefire, the continued killing of over 100 Palestinian children every single day uh, in Gaza is going to continue. And the only way that's going to stop is if there is a ceasefire, which would enable, you know, a lot of changes on the ground in Gaza, including hopefully a return of the hostages from uh, Gaza back to Israel. And also uh, the stopping of the killing of innocent Palestinians, particularly Palestinian children in Gaza. Um, that's the first step, and we're seeing a huge amount of ground well, ground uh, of support on the ground in the United States to make that happen. Unfortunately, it's not translated into any significant policy policy changes in the U.S. government. Um, you mentioned this, some of the psychological damage. Um, as somebody who's as a, a practitioner, or somebody who's close to this. Um, what is the approach of um, of the medical community in Gaza um, for treating this type of this this type of PTSD? I have no idea how to do this at that at that scale. I mean, I I don't think there is a treatment for this kind of PTSD because it's not PC, PTSD. PC, PTSD is post traumatic stress disorder. This is there's nothing post about what the Palestinian people are enduring on a daily basis in Gaza. It's never been post-traumatic. Um, the source of the trauma continues to be the occupation and the bombing and the insecurity that people live every day on the ground in Gaza. Therefore, there is no post to it. There is just an effort to manage an ongoing crisis on the mental health level of trauma that's being inflicted on the entire population on a daily basis. So I don't know if there's anywhere in the world that can adequately treat or any kind of resource that's available to adequately treat children in particular that are being exposed on a daily basis continuously their entire lives to violence and to trauma, to poverty imposed through closure and occupation. Um, I don't know what method one could go about trying to heal the spirits and the minds and the hearts of these people when the source of that trauma continues to be inflicted upon them every single day. Um, Steve Venda, you're super busy, um, doing the work that you're doing. So I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I want to ask you, uh, before we wrap up, um, for people who are listening to this and they want to learn more, um, 
not about necessarily about um, how they can help, um, but also how they should, how they can inform themselves about about how we got here. Um, do you have any suggestions of things people uh, listening to sh- listening to this podcast should listen to read or to go look up uh, people that they should be um, trying to learn from? Well, if you're looking for historical information as to, you know, and I think that if you want to understand what's happening in Gaza or what's happening in Palestine, you have to start at the root cause of the disposition of the Palestinian people from their homeland. That obviously is not uh, an easy subject to tackle, but it's also not impossible to do so. And, uh, you know, it's there's a variety of historical resources and contemporary ones, and even by, uh, you know, this kind of new historians in Israel that are quite accurate in portraying what happened to the indigenous population of Palestine, the indigenous Arab population who, uh, you know, were um, dispossessed of their homeland in 1948 through um, a colonial enterprise that came from mainly Europe um, to uproot them. Uh, and establish an exclusive Jewish state on the land of Palestine. Um, you know, and one can argue based on the genocide that was committed against the Jewish population in Europe, you know, whether their cause was just or not, it, that argument can be made from their perspective, uh, but it certainly cannot be made that the uprooting of the Palestinians and denying them a presence on their land was justified. There's no argument that can support that historically or morally or from a legal point of view. Uh, so I think it's important to go and find those sources. They're available everywhere. It doesn't take much to find some of the great historical contemporary works that have been done. I encourage you to refrain from um, some of the non-historical or people who are non-historians who may be trying to provide insight from a political perspective rather than from a historical one. There's plenty of those. Um, uh, and then work your way down because within the Palestinian narrative and understanding how we got to where we are in Gaza today, uh, you can work your way through what the occupation of 1967 of the Gaza Strip, st- how that started, and even the, go to 1956 when Gaza was occupied for six months by the Israeli army during the Suez uh, uh, invasion of the Suez Canal by France, Britain, and the Israeli army. Um, great massacres occurred in Han Yunus and in Rafah then as well. Hundreds of Palestinian men were lined up and ma- murdered. This is documented, by the way. Um, and that's a start in, in their refugee camps. Those refugee camps began in 1948. 1956, they were occupied for six months. Massacres occurred there. 1967, the occupation of the Gaza Strip began up until 2006, uh, where they were physically present inside Gaza. What did that mean? What did that occupation look like? What did it entail from a human rights perspective, from a legal perspective? There's a wide variety of sources on that. Again, you can use Israeli sources, even if you like. Just remember, just use documented historians, people who are giving you an objective analysis of what actually took place in Gaza the laws that were enacted to deny people their rights, to deny them their land, to deny them sovereignty and independence and equality on the ground. And then following the Palestinian first resistance of 1987, which began in Jabalia camp, the first uprising, and then the Oslo Accords, what that meant for the people in Gaza and how their lives changed as they became restricted and being able to move and leave the Gaza Strip into uh, the Israeli withdrawal in 2006. And what that meant for the Gaza uh, people, in addition to the uh, elections which came, which brought in the Hamas regime in Gaza, and how that changed the lives of the Palestinians as well, and what their what that further meant for them as a quality of life, as a political status in the world, and what that meant politically within the Palestinian dysfunctional system of national liberation. We all know that the the blame for the crisis in Palestine is not strictly one on the Israeli shoulders; that we on our own side have not done enough to stay unified and to present a unified face. And I'm not blaming anyone in particular. The forces that have been aligned against the Palestinians historically and from a political point of view have been tremendous. They come from, first and foremost, um, the international community led by the United States and including the European powers, which have done all they can to undermine Palestinian sovereignty and self-determination. And then, of course, uh, enforced by an Israeli uh, uh, governments, different governments and Israeli ideology, which is intending to deny the indigenous Arab population sovereignty and equality on their own land. And then um, not having support from the Arab governments, although the Arab people tremendously and overwhelmingly support the Palestinian movement for self-liberation and self-determination, the Arab governments have traditionally not done so um, and in a variety of different ways have undermined Palestinian liberation. And then finally, as I said, the Palestinian political um, National liberation movement itself has gone into either uh, agreements like the Oslo Accords, which uh, undermined their um, the, um, 
process for self-determination uh, and also uh, has brought forth a regime on the ground which has not represented the best interests of their people when it comes to um, pursuing their rights and their equal their effort to live secure on their own land uh, uh, away from violence imposed by the occupation regime and the settler colonial movement in the West Bank. Uh, all of these factors you take into consideration and just educate yourself on them. That's, I mean, people, you have to make an effort. Um, you can't wait for information to come to you. If you're truly interested in understanding this issue, go back and understand it historically. You should know what the Balfour Declaration is. You should know what the Great Revolt was from 1936 into 1939. Uh, the, the Great Revolt, where 10% of the Palestinian population were either uh, deported, injured, or killed by the British colonial uh, uh, regime that occupied Palestine. You should know about that. If you, you should know about what happened in 1947 and 1948, the massacres that occurred, the uproot and the upheaval of the Palestinian indigenous population and the creation of the state of Israel and what looked like for hundreds of Palestinian villages that were occupied and destroyed and the pe people who lived in refugee camps had nothing to come back to. You should understand what the Palestinian national movement looked like during those years up until 1967 when the PLO was formed and finally established as truly a representation of the Palestinian people. And then if you educate yourself, you see to where we are today how this frustration, this lack of any movement towards the basic objective of equality, self-determination, and freedom for the Palestinian people on their own land has been continuously denied by a variety of different parties, including some of our own on the Palestinian side, that has led to this effort, to this great level of frustration and despair among the people that has created, in many cases, a let's say, a, a philosophy that violence is the only way. And that's unfortunate because that's not going to obviously liberate Palestine. It's not going to give people freedom, hurting others and trying to fight because the powers against the Palestinian people are so immensely un unequal. There's no opportunity to do harm to your uh, enemy. All it does is create more victims and give them opportunities to strike back even harsher than, as we're seeing today in Gaza. People, educate yourself. And on there's a variety of sources that you can find unfiltered on social media to follow what's actually going on right now on the ground in Gaza. Um, Sean King on Instagram is a, just providing an immense amount of information from a variety of sources that come in unfiltered. And I think, you know, it's harsh to see those images, but it reminds us that this is actually, although it's a political issue, it's destroying the lives of, of innocent people on a regular basis. And we as Americans, me and myself, or as people who live outside, we have to bear some responsibility for what's happening there. And we also have the responsibility of organizing ourselves in, with the new philosophy uh, unifying ourselves, getting past whatever divisions that existed on the Palestinian side in the past, whether it's uh, uh, religious, whether it's sectarianism, whether it's ideological, um, we get past those differences and focus just on healing and rebuilding um, the lives of these innocent people in the Gaza Strip. That's what it's going to take for us to stand up. And we have to realize this is nobody is going to come to support the Palestinians in the future. No government, no regime, uh, none that has the true intentions of the Palestinian people at heart. And it's up to the community in the diaspora of the most educated, most talented people in the world are the Palestinian people. And we need to tap into those resources and those abilities and those talents and to start making a fundamental change in the lives of the people there. That's the only way that this is going to change. Steve, um, a very heartfelt thank you to you and your team for doing the work that you're doing and for taking time to share it with us. Um, if anyone wants to learn more, um, you can look up Palestine Children's Relief Fund online, um, on social media, very easy to find. Steve, thanks again. It's my pleasure. Thank you.